stand on the sidelines as a cheerleader and say, yay, keep going, keep going, you know. That's not what we're talking about in courage. The word encourage here means you walk up beside them and you put your arm around them and you say, let's go together. The idea of encourage here is like when you see two athletes running on a, on a track and one they jump in the hurdles and the one trips and falls and they hurt the ankle and the one ahead turns around and comes back and puts an arm around them and carries them across the finish line. You've probably seen videos like that of, of these students acting in that manner. That's what encouragement means. Walk alongside these guys. Help them out. Come along to their aid. If you see somebody failing, come along. Show them the right way. Show them what it means to be self-controlled. Titus is to set them, set them an example, to literally offer himself up as a model for which that they're going to eventually look like. You don't look like this now, but I'm being an example, and that Greek word there, example, means something that is coming, but it's not there yet. He says, be an example, because these guys, they don't look like Christ yet, but they will one day. And so, help them walk alongside, put your arm around them, because soon they will be godly too. Soon. And again, that's God speaking. That's God directing them, walk alongside these folks because they can look like me too. And I think if God has faith in somebody, maybe we should too. He's to display to them what it means to have integrity. His life needs to exemplify the seriousness that invites reverence, similar to what he was supposed to be teaching the older men too. And the goal is to live in such a way that people can't find a reason to condemn you, either in your speech or in your conduct. Does anybody right now have a reason to condemn you? Yep. <laughs> I got a list. I got a list of things you can find that are broken and, and wrong with my life. And here he's saying, walk with them teach them, encourage them, so that when the enemy comes, when the opponent comes, nobody can find any reason to find fault. Titus is supposed to show all these groups of people these different things and characteristics and teach them how to live, because that's what a godly life looks like. And again, there's things that overlap, um, but if we're going to be people who claim to love God, this is what it looks like. Why? Is the question now. What is the goal? What's the desired outcome? And we've touched on this already, but the goal of the older generation should be to teach the next generation. And when I say teach, what I mean is to live it out. Not to corner and lecture, not to sit down and say, let me tell you what you did wrong, but to really live it out with our lives. You know, this summer I attempted to introduce Eli to the piano. Um, it failed, but I attempted. And I said, all right, buddy, I was about your age when I started. I would love for you to do this. Your mom thinks that you'd be good at this. I think that you'd be good at this. Um, but he just didn't really show any real lasting interest. And he was catching on, but he's just kind of like, okay, I guess we have to do this again. Well, this last week, um, I sat down, and, and I haven't played piano for a long time, so I sat there for a half hour playing, and uh, enjoyable again. And, and then I left, and then about 10 minutes later, I hear the piano going again. I thought, Eli's in there playing the piano just pounding around, doing silly things. But you know, it wasn't enough for me to sit him down and say, you're going to learn this. I had to come alongside and show him, isn't this fun? Don't you want to do this? Don't you want to come along and, and learn how to play some of the songs you sing on Veggie Tales? Wouldn't this be fun to do? He didn't care until he somebody saw somebody else doing it. You know why you strive to live a godly life? Because it's not about you. Because it's not about me. That's why. It's about those who are around you. And we're not talking about unbelievers around you. We're talking about the Christian men and women that you're surrounded by who want to pursue God more, who want a deeper relationship, uh, who want to walk with God, who want to enhance their prayer lives, who are puzzled about the next step that they need to take. There are Christian men and women around you who are asking desperately, what is the next step I need to take? And by living out an actively godly life, we have the privilege of showing them. The older men are to be men worthy of respect. Why? 
because the very definition of the word of that worthy to be respect is an invitation. Masculinity bestows masculinity, and when the young see the old living a life of maturity and temperance and self-control and being even keeled through every storm of life, they say, I can do that too. That's what I want to look like. No matter what happens, that's what I want to look like too. Speaking of which, uh, my grandpa about a, a decade and a half ago was uh, got in a farming accident got his thumb chopped off. Um, he came in, went up to grandma and said, well, look what happened this time. That was his attitude. Well, look what happened. No need to cry, no need to scream, no, no need to lose his mind. It's just, well, I guess I don't have a thumb now. Even keeled. That's my goal. No matter what life happens, not, not that I don't pay attention, but to say, this is okay. This is okay. We'll get through. That's what the older men are to do, to lead the others to do that. The older women are to live out a godly life full of reverence and kind words and free from addictions and in control of themselves. Why? So that the younger women will learn what it means to follow God as well. And why should the younger women do that? Because they have families. They are raising godly children. They are being a blessing to their husband. Why? So that the gospel message is not spoken harshly against. All of this has a reason. It's not just about us. Young men need to leave godly lives. Why? So that when opponents come against them and against the gospel, they have no ammunition against these godly young men. The opponents to the gospel will come to destroy them, but the integrity of their lives, the conduct of their speech, the seriousness and good deeds will prove that the gospel is true and that their opponents are liars, and hopefully even lead them into Christ too. We are called to live to a standard of godliness because that's what God wants. And the bonus is that we are blessing and encouraging the believers around us. You know, it wasn't by accident that the proverb guy wrote this, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It wasn't by accident that King Solomon wrote that. You are valuable to the kingdom of God because God needs to use your godliness to help sharpen somebody else. And in turn, somebody else's godliness is going to come and work in your life too. We are not islands here. We are a community. And this is what God has called us. And that's why we live a godly life, to help shape and move and change and bless others. During the quarantine, something we really lacked was this, this sharpening of one another, because we didn't get the chance to meet. So I'm very glad that we can meet together and really pursue God together as his people. As we're closing today, I want to leave you with one more quote that I think is going to bless in, in your day. I should sure hope. It's from Charles Spurgeon, anyways. It says, the eagle-eyed, argus-eyed. What does argus-eye mean? I had to look it up. It means somebody who is um, looking very, very hard. So the exact same as eagle-eyed, just a different word. The eagle-eyed, argus-eyed world observes